Hello, hello, Cynthia Allen here at the end. It's, it's, it, is, it, is it two days, three days after the Move Better, Feel Better Summit ended? And I'm sure many of you were there, yeah? So we're, we're there, and if you weren't there, it doesn't matter. We're glad to have you here today, for sure. And um, I'm excited because we're going to be exploring this using your superpower for good. And you may uh, think you know what your superpower is. You may not. But I hope to help you be much, much clearer about it at the end of the session. I bet, I bet you know what your kryptonite is. I bet you you have a sense of your kryptonite. If you want to pop that in the chat, you can pop your kryptonite in the chat. <clears throat> so today, while you're doing that, I'll come back and read some of those. Today, we're going to be doing a Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement lesson together. We're going to talk about the seven keys to unleashing your movement superpower. I'm going to introduce you to an opportunity to continue to study with me. And oh, great. That's a great question, Luca. I'll get that. Let me finish this sentence and I'll get that to you. And the question, and then we're going to, I'm going to take question and answers for as long as I can keep my voice. And you can ask me any kind of question about your own specific health movement issues, or if, um, if you uh, have something you want to ask about studying with me, you can ask that too. So I'll, I'll try to be very helpful to you during that time. And kryptonite in the superhero story of Superman, not um, in, he has something that whenever he's exposed to it, he loses all his power just loses all his power. So what is the thing that makes you lose all your power? I mean, he just becomes like a limp rag on the ground when he's exposed to his kryptonite. So what is the thing that you think of as your kryptonite, if we're using that, you're the thing that makes it impossible for you to have, a, to really access your superpower. Okay. Okay, so we're getting some here. My kryptonite is the thought I'll do it later or it doesn't matter if I skip it today. I know that one. Uh, depression, it will hurt. Internalized ageism, mm, pain and depression. Mm. Yeah, insomnia. These things are big, aren't they? Getting older, mm -hmm, getting older. Gluten, sugar, dairy. I got a, I got a, 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 the middle one there is definitely on mine. Arguments and misogyny, disrespect, pollen, um, makes me tired. Okay. Distraction, fear of fear. Oh, poor digestion. Um, losing focus all over body joint and joint and muscle pain, painful hip, sugar, fear of falling. I'm thinking that I have too much to do, imposter syndrome. Okay, excellent. So we've got a wide range here. Reaction to trauma triggers, fear it will never get better. Low back pain, hopelessness, age. Okay, we, we've got, you keep them coming in, but we know now for sure that uh, we have some things that we recognize about ourselves that maybe get in the way of claiming our superpower. So let's hope we make a bunch of progress with that today. Get a, get a good start on it anyway. So I want to introduce you to the seven secret keys that I feel are necessary in order to unleash your movement superpower. And I want to talk about two right now before we even start doing any movement together and maybe demonstrate it just a little bit. Um, boy, the power of these coming in. That's this. You all are really digging digging deep here to share. I so appreciate that. Um, so we're going to talk about these two keys. And maybe even in this first key, some of you will begin to find some help. So the first key in my program is respecting yourself, respecting yourself. Now, in the idea of uh, maybe people who are aware of Aretha Franklin, R E S P C T. Find out what it means to me. You know that might that might bring up a little bit of fun for you, but in fact, it's not so easy sometimes to respect ourselves. And I want to break that open a little bit. 
So if you think about respecting yourself, what might, you just take a moment to think about that. What, what do you think the characteristics are that would show that you have respect and regard for you? What would be the characteristics of that? Hmm. So for many of us, when we have difficulties, we go into a blame state, right? We blame ourselves. We take it on as shame. Uh-huh. Judging and believing that there's judge, I see him judging and believing curiosity rather than judging and believing. There's a good reason for what's going on. Okay. So there's a, there's a uh, an ability there to find the self-care and curiosity. I like that. Self-care, accepting what is, taking care of yourself, loving ourselves, smiling to ourselves, being proud of who we are, no matter how we look. Amen. Love and accepting. You're aware of and take care of your needs. You show respect, demanding respect from each others. And that is definitely an important action. We're going to be focusing today on what we can do internally more, but certainly hanging around with people that don't respect you or accepting disrespect on a regular basis from other people is not good. Uh, but it means that we're not, of course, respecting ourselves in all likelihood. Sometimes we don't have as many choices around who we're with as we would like. Paying attention to what my body needs. Um, Valuing my own feelings, even with, I would say, uh, ADHD or uh, autism, okay. Confidence, not doing things that will harm ourselves. Boundaries, no comparison, not projecting your own pain to yourself and repeat patterns. Willingness to pause and stop rather than push through. Oh, well, Rachel's an old student of, of mine. <laughs> The young student is an old student of mine. So she kind of has a little bit of a head start on what some of the places we're going to go with respecting yourself today. So, you know, respecting yourself has all these things that people are bringing up are super important. So I want to, I want to acknowledge those. And in the realm of, of um, how we live our life and then how we do movement, I'm going to really, really tune into this pushing ourselves uh, pretending that our pain doesn't matter, that we can just move through whatever is bothering us over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? So this will be familiar to some of you. Um, and then also there's another aspect of respecting yourself, which is, I, I, was hurt, I heard it a little bit above on somebody said about a belief. It's not believing that we can get better. It's not believing that we can cope, we can learn to cope more or to uh, enjoy more moments in the day. Or sometimes we are so certain that we'll never be able to do something that anytime that thing even sort of like has a little um, hint of possibility, we close down to it, right? So in the Feldenkrais work, which we're going to be exploring in these movement lessons, this issue of respecting yourself is just super, super important. You hear us say, or if this is your first time here, you're going to hear me say, do less, move only within your comfort zone. It is not true in the Feldenkrais method that you should be working on um, directly confronting yourself with pain. Because when you're confronting yourself with pain, that is you do something and it creates more pain. I understand that some of you are coming with a lot of pain already, but you do the thing and it creates more pain. And then you do the thing a little bit more and it still creates more pain. And then you do it a little bit more and it still creates more pain. Um, I think they need to be muted, Arlene. Uh, the, then what happens is we start to re then what happens is we start to reinforce the pain cycle. Okay. So uh, it's super valuable in our work to really recognize that, that the pain is a signal. When we go to move and we find ourselves holding our breath, 
we find ourselves tensing, we get tighter, we find ourselves going, that doesn't feel good. Now that might not be like severe pain, it might be like the tiniest little edge of something that you think, that doesn't feel good. But we think, well, I need to work through that, I need to push harder. We don't do that in this work. We come to what we call a learning, I call a learning edge. And a learning edge is a place where you feel safe, where the nervous system goes, oh, hey, I might be okay. And this, hey, this new thing is kind of interesting. It could hold some promise for me. I might want to check it out. But when we come to an area where we go, oh, that feels Oh, that feels algae. Let me do it 20 more times. That is going to lead to more problems. It's going to lead to more problems. So we want to create that safety within the nervous system that shows you respect yourself, that shows the parts of yourself. Someone's in charge of this life experience that is really listening. Sometimes I think that what goes on in our complex psyche is we have forgotten to adult for ourselves. We've forgotten to adult for ourselves. Many of us would adult really well as a parent or grandparent. Maybe you didn't do as great as a parent as you would want to, but as a grandparent, you're just rocking it, right? And when, when a child comes to you and says, my belly hurts, my belly hurts, you wouldn't say to them, eat more food. Let's eat some more of that stuff you just ate, right? You wouldn't say to them, oh, hey, they come back and they go, oh, no, mom, uh, grandma, mom, I fell, dad, I fell off the jungle, jungle gym and I hit my knee and now I can hardly walk. You would not say, hey, let's do some more of that. You wouldn't say that. So it's really true also within these lessons that we want to really respect ourselves. We want to challenge ourselves to respect ourselves. We want to adult for ourselves. And then again, maybe something comes up. Oh, I love those little, little stars. Somebody knows how to use stars. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe then the, uh, the opportunity comes up to do something in a lesson that you thought, mm, that's never been okay for me. Huh? I wonder, though, if I just play with the edges of this, what might happen? That can be really healthy as long as it's that learning edge. It's not kicking yourself into these pain, fear, flight, fight, fawning stages, but you just are able to really be present with yourself. Now, the second key that I want to talk about, and both of these keys I'm hoping you're going to use in the movement lesson we're going to do, is slowing down and taking time. Now we've all heard about meditation and mindfulness, but applying that to movement is something that is often not done. And so when we're doing Feldenkrais awareness through movement, we want to be sure that we are slowing way down so that we will be able to notice more and reduce the likelihood of that fear response and reduce the likelihood of actually exacerbating pain or injury. So if you would do a little experiment with me and you would just sit at the front of your chair for a moment. And I uh, just, you can just, you can, uh, don't close your eyes, but just listen to what I'm going to say and then do it very quickly. Look one direction and the other. Look to your right, look to your left quickly. Okay. And come back. That just wants each direction. Then the question is, what did you notice? And you just need to answer this internally right now. Stay with yourself for a moment. What did you notice? And probably what you noticed is the motion. And you may or may not have noticed whether it felt good or not. Now, I'd like you to go half that speed, whatever your quickly speed was, go half that speed to look towards the right and to the left. 
And in that half that speed, hmm, what do you start to become aware of that you couldn't become aware of in the fast version? Uh -huh. Okay, and now we're gonna do one quarter the speed you just did. One quarter, can you graduate down to one quarter of that second speed? And you look to your right and you look to your left. And now some of you are starting to notice the things that you see. And you're also starting to notice the border of where it's uncomfortable. And you may feel your breath arising and falling. And if you don't feel that yet, and you take that speed that you just did and you knock it down to one eighth of it and you so slowly look one direction and the other so slowly almost like you're kind of in molasses and the molasses helps to slow you down as you turn And now you really start to notice some things, don't you? Now you start to notice some things. And I'm hoping you also feel that the slowing down gives you a calm in your nervous system. That's not always true. For some people, when we slow down, our trauma, past trauma responses gets a little scared. So we'll have to have pause and we'll have to have little conversations with ourselves to check in, to make sure we're okay. But for the majority of the people, as you slow down more and more and more, you get calmer and calmer and calmer and calmer. So learning to slow down and take time and the process of calming is a gradual skill to build. It's not something that happens immediately. It's not something that happens immediately. So I'm gonna to begin to take you through a longer lesson. Yeah, yeah, you're slow, you become impatient. So Martha, that's, that's, that's why it is, it is a skill. It's a skill to build. And I think it is one that you can build, but it's not uh, always present for us. I remember when I first took awareness through movement myself uh, um, almost 30 years ago, um, I, remember thinking it was the stupidest, slowest stuff I had ever done. I just couldn't understand why anybody would spend so much time turning to look. And then these instructions that seemed so small and made no sense, even though I was doing them and getting better. And I admitted that I was like, oh no, I definitely see more afterwards when I'm done. I feel better during the week, but the whole thing just seems ridiculously slow. I couldn't, my, my nervous system was always in this really ramped up place so that my impatience was really, really strong. It was, it was a really big tussle. And sometimes it's still a tussle for me to really slow down in awareness through movement lessons. It's a little more likely for me now to be more difficult to slow down in other aspects of my life, to carry the less, the the learning from awareness through movement to other aspects of my life. Some of that deep compulsiveness in me that wants to move and do things fast is more present in these other kinds of experiences. Yeah, there's a great song, slow down, you move too fast. <laughs> yeah, I love that song. Is it Jamis? Yeah. Now I wanna say something to the person who said, I've been getting pain doing Feldenkrais, so maybe I need to do less effort before we go into this lesson. So the answer to that is po possibly two or threefold. Uh, one is that yes, way less effort, almost, almost like you think, what am I really even doing? Uh, can be very, very helpful. Slow is going to be very, very helpful. So if you haven't been moving slow, it can be very helpful, but it's also true that if you're somebody who has an autoimmune condition or you're somebody who has not moved very much in a particular way for a long time, you might have some kind of rebound soreness. So I would suggest for people that that sort of sounds familiar to you, that you don't do as long the whole lesson. You do a part of it and then you sleep through a part of it 
or you get up and walk around and then you come back and decide if you want to do a little more or if you want to stop there. And then gradually, I think over time, you'll able be able to do longer lessons. So I don't know whether that happened for you in short lessons or longer lessons, but there's, there's a variety of reasons that could happen in the beginning and hopefully that'll help you. Uh, so slowing down, making much, much less effort. Use your breath as your barometer. So when you feel that your breath is holding or it's starting to speed up, you kind of go, hmm, what's up with that? Maybe my body, my mind, my psyche doesn't really like going there right now. Maybe I'm pushing myself past something. And then taking more frequent breaks or even skipping large parts of the lesson until you feel like you're able to really stick with it. So let's do, we're going to do a lesson that you can do either sitting back in a chair or recliner or on a bed or floor. I think you'll, before you move, I want to do a couple demonstrations for you. I think you'll be, get the most out of it if you can lie flat because then your anti-gravity muscles don't have to work to hold you up. So as long as you're in an upright position, it's a little bit more difficult for that release to happen, but I understand that some of you not, might not be able to. Now I want to give you a demo. I'm going to be asking you to work with your hands, your arms, and I want to show this now because I'm not going to have any models. I want you to be able to stay with your own sensation, and the movement is going to be very simple for the most part. So I will be asking you to bring, say, your right hand to your belly, and to slide it some different places on your body. I'm gonna ask you to slide it different places on your body. Now, again, if you go, oh no, my right shoulder or my right arm, it's got a lot of problems. It does not really move something. It's tight, it's kind of might, might even be spastic, you maybe have a stroke, or you might have a big injury here in your rotator cuff or something. This is, this is gonna be a great lesson for you, but it'll be a better lesson for you if you explore some options. So one option is to think about your fingertips leading. Another one is to think about your elbow pushing. And then another one is to use your other hand to come across because you go, no, every time I do eat the nap, it hurts. It's to take your other hand and kind of find a nice way to hold on to it. And then you actually passively move the arm. Because I'm in this case, this is my right arm that I'm wanting to take across to the left side of my body. So I come along with my left hand and I just kind of grab the bones of my hand a little bit, not, not pinchy, just a little bit. And then coming on through. Okay, so those are options. If you've got fear around an arm, if you have a frozen shoulder and there are parts of the movement that are really difficult for you, do them in your imagination. Do not push through pain. We are not pain seeking. We are comfort seeking. We are not pain seeking. We are comfort seeking. It doesn't matter if you do the lesson right. Stay, listen to my directions, then try something and then go, something about that isn't right for me. Respect yourself. Find a different way to do it, okay? So go ahead and make, make yourself into whatever position that you want. Have a towel. If you're going to lie down, have a towel or two with you, like I said in the, um, in the email you got. So you could put something under your head. You could also put something under an elbow. If you're laying back and your arms hanging back bothers you, you could put something under a shoulder. You could put something under the elbow. These are all options that you can look. You can have your legs long uh, or your feet in standing. If your legs long feels best for you with something under your knees, you can place something under your knees. So I hope that's what you meant by support, Luca. Um, so I'm gonna give you a moment to do that, okay? To get yourself into a good position for that. All right. And I appreciate those of you who have got your cameras on you so I can see how people are interpreting the instructions. I don't want to stress anyone else out that didn't 
didn't digest the camera. I think I've got enough here. I just want to acknowledge this, how helpful that is for me to be a good teacher, to be able to see many of you. Now, whether you are relaxing back in a chair or recliner or on a bed or the floor, actually do take that moment to feel that place of potential relaxation. Potential relaxation. What would that mean? Well, for most of us, it has something to do with noticing our breath and letting our breath just become easy, not trying to breathe a, set, a, a particular way. In a way, always trying to force ourselves to be to breathe in a particular way could be seen as a form of disrespect. We could argue other ways too, but for this lesson, I would say, let's stay with the idea that we want to let the deepest part of our nervous system find the breath that it wants and not one that we've been taught is a good idea. Part of that respecting. And then begin to notice as you follow the breath, how your breath moves through you. When you inhale, probably something expands somewhere. Maybe in two or three different places. Maybe in a, in a kind of order, like, oh, it expands here first, then second, then third. Or maybe you really feel all of your breath really in just one area. It comes in at one time, and then it leaves at one time. Probably as you breathe in, you can feel the temperature of the air coming in your nostrils. Maybe you never thought about it, but now when we slow down, you have the time to think about it. You can go, oh yeah, the air coming in is, is a different temperature than when I breathe out my nose. It won't be the same if you are breathing in and out of your mouth, that won't be as clear. The nostrils actually warm and cool the air. And then come to notice how your shoulders are, are in space or on the ground, on the bed, the floor. Notice first, maybe the dominant side shoulder, how it rests. Maybe parts of it feel lifted or parts of it feel pushed back. Maybe it feels flat, maybe it feels rounded. How would you describe your dominant shoulder blade to yourself and your shoulder uh, joint right now? And then compare that to the non-dominant shoulder, the shoulder blade. And then just scan a little bit through the back of yourself for how the shape of your back is and relationship to the surface behind it, where you feel parts of yourself that sort of rest back or push back and where you feel parts of yourself that are lifted. And feel how your buttocks or your pelvis is on the surface. And whether you lean much more heavily on, heavily on one side or the other. Whether there's more space behind your low back on one side or the other. And then come up to the area of your neck and just tune in a little bit to the muscle tone or the softness or the tension or the tightness on the dominant side of your neck. So if you're right hand dominant, listen to maybe the right 
side of the neck first. And if you even want to sort of very lightly touch yourself, you can do that across there and across your shoulder a little bit. Just feel the tone there. And the kind of touch we use is not a massaging touch. It's very light. It's a listening touch. It's like the touch that we would bring to a little newborn kitten or a newborn of any kind, right? Like a newborn baby. It's, it's this listening touch. And then bring it to your non-dominant side, your attention to your non-dominant side. And again, if you want to touch, you can touch, you can decide. Just comparing a little bit the sensation on the neck and the shoulders. And then with your hands resting by your side, kind of tune into the facial tissue, the, the muscles, the skin on the dominant side of your face. Again, if you're right-handed, the right side of your face. You know, do they feel tight or drawn or loose and free? Up around the hairline, right around the ear. Sometimes there's quite a lot of tension there. And you're not going to try to fix anything. It's hard to fix those things consciously anyway. But you're not going to try to fix anything. We're just noticing so you can compare as you go along in the lesson to what's changed. And then come to the other side of your face and begin to tune into the way that the tissues are organized there, whether they feel like they, they respond to gravity, they kind of hang back or down towards gravity, or if they feel kind of clenched. The jaw, the cheek, the eye, ear, the hairline. And what's the difference again between the two sides? Now, I'm going to suggest that you start with your dominant hand, but if for some reason you think, no, that dominant hand, arm, or shoulder is not the best one for me to work with, you go with it. I'm going to try to teach it as if uh, it doesn't matter which side you chose, but stick with the one for a while if you can. So begin to take that dominant hand or arm, whether it's your right or your left, it starts out lying beside you on the ground. Can you have it lying beside you on the ground or beside you on the chair? Not, instead of on your belly, can your arms be long, both arms be long beside you? Okay. Now begin to slide that dominant hand up onto your, probably onto your thigh is where it will come the easiest first. The thigh and then probably the belly. So it comes off of the, the floor and it comes to the thigh and the belly. And it just kind of slides across the other side of the belly to the other side of the belly. And then it just slides back. And at a certain point you'll feel as it slides back to the side. So if it's your right, it slides back to the right. Your elbow kind of gets heavy and your arm could kind of slide back off and drop on the ground. Just let it slide back off onto the ground. Yeah, that's nice. And just repeat that movement two or three times so you get used to the idea that the very least amount of movement and ease is needed in order to bring the hand onto the thigh, the belly, and to stroke over to the other side of the pelvis and belly. When it gets over there this next time, rest the elbow and the arm and the hand on your belly, on your low abdomen, just rest it there. How restful can you be in that place? And maybe you'll feel some breath arising uh, there or not. Maybe you feel a little gurgle, who knows what you feel there, right? Under that listening hand. And then just slide your hand back off to the side and let it drop off again. Mm -hmm. So now if you find that already it's difficult for you to bring your arm onto your belly, you can use your other hand to reach over and grab it. 
So, you know, and just, and use it as the vehicle. So I, you can think about those options I offered you earlier, but if it's okay with you to continue, I'm just going to use my words now around this idea of bringing your hand on to the belly. And this time think of your fingertips as sort of leading the movement. They're, they're, they're sliding and gliding. The fingertips are sliding and gliding across the other side of the belly. And then once they kind of get to the other side of the low belly, so let them kind of come up a little bit to where they would hold or cup your low ribs. Hold or cup your low ribs. And there underneath the low ribs, uh, feel the breath. Uh, Erica, I think there is sound because people are following my directions. So probably need to sign out, sign back in or turn off your video and see if that helps. And then go ahead and let the hands slide back down, slide all the way back down out to the side and rest. And again, it's the same hand, slide it onto your thigh, onto your belly. Think of the fingertips going across. Yeah, I saw someone put their feet up in the standing position. So their feet are flat, the knees are bent. That's great. Take care of yourself. Good respect. Let your hand come up this time across the belly to the low ribs and then up to maybe the mid ribs. And just listen there to your own hand and what kind of life arises underneath that hand. Breath in, the breath out. And maybe those ribs move when you breathe in and maybe they don't. Either way is okay. And then again, you just reverse the journey ever so slowly letting the hands slide back down and off. Now, for someone who's impatient, like we heard from somebody earlier, something I relate to, this might be becoming very hard for you. So kind of just notice that, talk with yourself about it a little bit. Go ahead and slide your hand up very slowly, very gently, across and up until it comes to more like underneath your armpit on the other side. And you just listen, you breathe and you listen. And you remind yourself that if you are impatient, you have choices. You can just stop, you can sit up, you can roll over, or you can come back to it when you're ready. And then slide your hand all the way back down and off to the side. Now I'm suggesting a specific kind of trajectory, but the trajectory might not be quite right for you. You might feel like you need a trajectory that's a little different. So this next time when you bring your hand up onto your belly and you slide it across, you just feel for yourself, is there something in there that says, this is not so pleasant? And then could you change the direction or the speed or the some way you change it, okay? And to make it better for you. Or you reach across and you use your other hand on the elbow. Because now we're going to come up the other side underneath that armpit. And then we're just going to kind of slide in front of the shoulder until our hand is sort of more resting. Fingertips are sort of resting draped over the shoulder a little. Mm -hmm. And then let the hand slide back down and off. It. Beautiful. And then when you're ready, you bring the hand once again to slide on 
it comes across in the trajectory that works for you. Maybe it's a little not as much across for you. That's fine. Maybe it comes up the middle of your breastbone. That's fine. It comes up then all the way to that opposite shoulder or somewhere there in the shoulder. And maybe you could just slide it up onto your neck a little bit, onto your shoulder, and then pause there and just lift your elbow a little bit forward forward of your body, a little bit towards the ceiling if you're on your back, just lift it and lower it. Not a lot, nothing that hurts. The hand is stable. The elbow just lifts and lowers, lifts and lowers. Now the next time that it lifts and then it lowers, pause. The hand is still on the shoulder. You lowered, you pause, you take a couple of breaths. Then when you're ready, you lift the elbow a little bit again and you lower it ever so slowly and you pause again. And then you bring your hand back down your body, stroking down. The stroking is very important in this lesson. If it, for some reason you find it disturbing, that's something to be interested about and you can explore how you would respect yourself in that way, that this actual contact with your body normally calms the nervous system. And it lets the nervous system know you're not going to do anything weird that might bother the shoulder. We're doing a motion now that's very similar to what a baby would do to eventually get food to its mouth. So let's do that this time. You bring the hand up, you explore the trajectory that feels just right for you. Maybe it comes to the shoulder, the throat. Maybe it comes to the mouth. And just there with your fingertips on your mouth, just gently bring your fingertips a little towards each other and then spread them away like they're stroking the sides of your lower jaw and then towards each other like they're stroking your lips. And then away. Very simple. It's nice. And then go, go ahead and let the hand come back onto the side of the face, the ear, stroke up the other ear. So you're coming up the other side, if that's available to you, until you feel like you could place sort of the back of the forearm, like almost like you're arm wants to turn at a certain point and you can place the back of your forearm on your forehead or it could be anywhere on the forearm or it could even be the back of the hand and you rest it there for a moment and just very very gently feel how the bony back of the arm or forearm or hand can touch and wiggle the skin on the forehead it can wiggle skin on the forehead, it could, uh, maybe a wiggle's not a great word. How about if it takes it a little left and a little right, the skin on the forehead, a little left and a little right. And if your eyes have been open, you might want to close them now. And when you feel that the skin won't go any further, if you keep leading the uh, fingers, the back of the arm, the elbow in the same direction, it'll start to just barely turn your head a little bit. And then if you pull with the elbow in the opposite direction, it'll turn the head the other way. So we're very passively turning the head a little bit now by moving the, using the elbow as kind of the engine. First, we let the skin of our forehead, the, this, the slackness is taken up in one direction and then the bone kind of catches the other bone and it sort of rolls the head just a little bit. And then you go back in the direction that you came from. Small amounts, small amounts. Yeah, good. And then when you're ready, just ever so gently fold that elbow back down in towards your face and chest. Let the hand stroke back down the opposite side of the neck, shoulder, body, and come all the way down until it's ready to drop off the side for you.
Now, take a moment to notice as you lie here, what's the difference in your sensation between the arm, the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, the neck on the side that you have been moving, your dominant side, probably. What is it compared to the other side? Now let's begin to do some of these lessons with the other side, some of these movements with the other side. So again, you can take breaks anytime you like, with whether your feet are flat and your knees are bent or your legs are long, or you might want to roll onto a side and take a break. If you're sitting, be sure that you have yourself as supported as you can be so that you don't have to work hard in your sitting position and come to tuning into your non-dominant side. For many of you, this will be your left instead of your right. So the side that you haven't worked with and start at the beginning. Now, I'm not going to give you so much direction now so that this idea of, re of really slowing down and taking time becomes more important, doesn't it? Because I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna spoon feed you each direction, but you're gonna start at whatever you remember the beginning to be. You let that arm, that hand come up onto the thigh, the belly and it strokes across. It finds a place to rest, to listen. If it's contact, listen through the palm of the hand. Listen with your attention. And then it slides back off and drops. And then you decide when you want to do the next movement and where you want to slide your fingers to the next time. nice yeah and so maybe you skip places maybe you're unclear it doesn't matter you can find a place to slide your hand to if you go man this arm's really hard to move i need to use my other hand my other arm to help me then you can do that absolutely you can do that if you need to use your imagination you can do that but the key qualities here are to find the, the trajectory of motion that feels good to you or feels better, at least, at least better. And to have this attitude of really feeling and sensing your shape and your temperature of your skin or the wrinkles of your clothing or whatever, the softness of your belly, and then when your hand rests, wherever you decide it rests, you're listening, you're listening with the hand. You're listening with the hand. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Yeah. And the next time the arm is off and down to the side, just pause there for a moment. And just ask yourself if you've been aware of your breathing this whole time, or have you kind of lost track of it? Remember I said that breath would be a barometer. Now, some of you are saying, gosh, this lesson is so easy. This movement is so easy. Why would I need to pay attention to my breath? And others of you are saying this lesson is so hard. I haven't been able to pay attention to my breath. So this next time that you do the movement, follow the natural rhythm of your breathing throughout it. And this time you're going to bring the hand still at that same slow, easy speed, but all the way up to that opposite shoulder. And then just let the fingertips sort of rest there. But you're paying attention to your breath as you do it. Uh -huh. That's it. Good. And then when your fingertips have been resting there for a moment or two, a breath or two, an inhale, an exhale, 
and inhale and exhale. Slide the fingers over towards the mouth. And there on the mouth, just let the fingers touch the lips, like as if the fingers were gonna become the shape of the lips when they were pursed and then open the fingers along the jaw and then close the fingers. So the thumb is what's opening probably on one side and the fingers on the other. You're just touching yourself a little bit there, just stroking that very sweet lower jaw and lips, not massaging. It's a very light stroking, feather weight. And then slide your hand back over to the side, pause with it there and see what it would be like with that fingers draped over the shoulder to bring your elbow up and down a little bit. And it could be only a half an inch, it could be two or three inches, it could come all the way up towards the mouth, but it should be comfortable, it should be comfortable or you're at least seeking, how can I make it more comfortable? You're not looking to pressure yourself into anything. Good, good. And then let the hand slide all the way back down and off to the side. Definitely some things have changed between the two shoulders, the two sides of your pelvis, the two sides of your low back. And you may not be able to, to notice that yet. That's okay. But I'm, I'm pretty confident it has changed and probably in a very positive direction because you've been respecting yourself because you're slowing down and you're taking time. Now begin to bring both hands onto the thighs, to the belly, crossing the hands over each other at some point, sliding the hands up underneath the uh, other opposite side, underneath the opposite armpit to the opposite shoulders. So your arms will eventually be very, very much crossed. Both elbows will be coming in towards your middle, towards your midline as your hands rest on your shoulders, and then just slide the hands down again off the arms, the torso, your body, let them fall off to the sides. That's, yeah. Oh, you guys are doing great. Just doing great at this slowing down and taking time. I just love it. I hope you can feel the pleasure of that. And then do it one more time. And this time as you do it, really notice which arm are you putting on top. As you cross over, one arm is underneath, one arm is on top. Mm -hmm. And then the hands come to the shoulders and then just lift both elbows a little bit and lower them. And lift the elbows. And of course, as you lift the elbows a little bit forward, the fingers can slide a little bit more back, right? Towards the floor behind you or towards the sofa, the bed or the couch or the chair. They can slide a little bit more behind you. And what if that from that position, you wanted to go ahead and somehow bring the crossed arms up to your forehead could you do that? Turning the back of the crossed arms to your forehead. And then fold the elbows back in and the hands come back down to the shoulders and the stroke back down the front of your body and off to the sides again.
Yeah. Well, this time, let's bring the hands up onto the, your body, but cross a different arm on top. Now, if you aren't clear about that, I'm pretty sure you cross the same on, arm on top both times. So if you start out and you go, oh, there it is. There's my left arm on top. Try to put your right on arm on top this time and then continue the stroking up. But the arms are crossed over differently. When the hands reach the shoulders, you'll just let them rest there for a minute. You lift the elbows and bring it down and you lift the elbows and you bring them down, let the fingers slide. Just, and then maybe you can take the back of the arms. They're not gonna be crossed as much for sure. The elbows open out pretty wide and lay them on your forehead or the bridge of your nose. And from here, you might feel like you could begin to unfold one arm above you to rest on the ground, or it'll be above you touching the back of the chair and then the other. Or you may go, no, that's just too much for me right now. Let's not do that much. And then you just fold the arms back in, slide them back down over your face, in front of your body, off to the sides. And then one more time, let's go back to your natural way of crossing your arms. What are the natural way is for you? Stroking them up, crossing up over each other, up the sides of your body, slow, gentle, finding the pathway that works for you. When the hands come to the shoulders, then begin to lift the elbows a little bit more into the air so that you could put the back of the arms. The forearms will turn out the back of the forearms will go towards the forehead. The bottom side will turn forward. This fleshy part will turn forward. And then just see then from there, can you unfold one arm to let it rest on the ground behind you? And then the other, or is that difficult? Just notice what it's like. And then you fold them back in. And then you stroke back down the front of your body. I don't know. I'm noticing as I try to do this, in case anyone needs to see references later on the replay, that I fold back in differently than I go up, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if anyone else is noticing that or not. I don't have my arms crossed over the same way up as when I come down. Funny. Ah. And when your arms are down by your side this time, just pause. That's going to be our last movement in this sequence. Now we're going to check to find out what has changed. What has changed from beginning to end? What has changed from beginning to end? So as you're lying there or sitting there and you're just noticing your breath, maybe you notice, hmm, Hmm. I might be breathing deeper or there's more places in me that respond to breath. The inhalation and the exhalation. More parts of me are moved to the action of breathing or not. And then tune into your right shoulder, the shoulder blade, the shape of the shoulder, the weight of it. How is that compared to earlier? Turn into the left and compare the sensations of its size and its shape, its lightness, its heaviness, its roundedness, its flatness. Now to earlier, what has changed? Grow your observation skills. You feel anything different in the tissues along the side of your neck, 
the, the tissue part of the neck, the tissue part of the face, the muscles of the face compared to earlier. One side and then the other. The way that your pelvis is resting or the way you're sitting on your bottom. Do you notice there? The space behind your low back on either side. And then just begin to think about what will be your process for starting to get up from this position. If you're on a bed or floor, if you're in a chair and you are able to stand, think about the process for getting closer to the edge of the chair so you could come up to stand. And then just begin to gradually find your way to being upright and sitting and eventually standing. And when you stand, just take a moment to feel. And I'm going to say this because some of you are standing. It doesn't mean anybody else has to be in standing or even are coming up yet or even thinking about it. <clears throat> just feel how the arms are hanging in space, how the shoulder blades are hanging in space, how the tissues of your face and your jaw are hanging in space. how your body is sitting on your legs. And then go for a little walk around. And maybe you feel something interesting as you walk. Now come on back when you're ready and just feel yourself come to sitting, especially if you're on the floor and feel that, you know, that's another organization. So you take a moment to feel that as well. And you remember earlier, I had you do that experimentation of turning your head very, well, first I did fast, but don't do fast, please. Very slowly, right and left or left and right. And why don't you do that now very slowly and just notice that there's something about it that seems easier. Maybe your shoulders know more about what you're doing. Maybe your collarbones know more about what you're doing. Maybe your neck is just more available to the movement, even though it didn't seem like we did anything specifically with the neck. Great. So when you're ready, you can start to put some of your response, your uh, experiences into the chat. I'm also going to go ahead and take us into um, uh, a little bit more about the program so that we can learn a little bit more about what it would mean. Let's see, that's not what I want. Let's see if I can talk here. And <clears throat> so lots of things being said, isn't there over there? I've never listened to my body before. I've used it to take my head places. Mm. 
right scapular dominant side, less winged. Discovered how stiff and sore my right shoulder is from an old injury. This process released that tightness. Amazing, so easy now. Neck much less tight after this exercise. Unbelievably relaxed, more soft in my movement and true and truing. Uh, I think maybe that was supposed to be breathing easier, but I'm not sure. Precious momento for me. Yeah, for sure, Maria and Clara. That's a very common lesson for you, isn't it? You've taught it many times. Longer arms. Well, let's take a look now at this idea of your movement superpower reveals. So what are you thinking your movement superpower is at this point? I'm curious if you have an idea of what your movement superpower might be. Just ponder that in your own head for a moment. So it's, from my view, it's your learning body. It's your learning body. And your body is always learning. But the question is, what is it that we're learning? What are we learning? When we're babies and toddlers, if we're given a fairly, self, a fairly safe environment, we will explore all kinds of movements. If we're born fairly healthy without... Uh, disability, and we've got a pretty safe environment, we will explore all kinds of movements, all kinds of movements, and we will explore all the sensations that go with that. The sensations of uh, when it's pleasant and when it's not, when something didn't get us the results that we wanted to get. We will organize gradually ourselves to where we might be able to come to roll over onto our belly and then back and then uh, up to sitting and then rocking back and forth. And yes, there are people that will not be able to follow all these development of sequences, but no matter who you are and what ha uh, was the case for you in childhood, your body has been learning all along. Some of us have to spend more time learning how to swallow, how to digest, how to regulate temperature. It's learning. It's learning by looking at others, by how others respond to our movements. It's learning. But the truth is that we all learn to move just good enough. So if we go back again and look at these baby, this baby again, we will find out in the studies of children that the child will take you know, a few thousand movements and then it will call it what I say is good enough because it needs to go on to accumulate the next movement. A 4,000 sounds like a lot. You think they'd be perfectionist by then, but they, they are really just feeling, sensing, wondering, and there's a deep impulse in them that's saying, okay, now that you've got that one good enough, let's go to the next one. And then let's go to the next one. And it all looks mostly like, for most children, it looks like mostly play. Now there are times in play where they get frustrated and difficult, or they feel trapped by their arm in a very unusual place, or they can't get to their belly or the back, and they may find that they cry or fuss with that. But there's an awful lot of time in which they're absolutely just delighted with the things that their body is doing, whether it's making raspberries with their mouth or uh, pooping in their diapers, they're delighted with what they're doing. So, but that there is deep inside them, like there is for every animal, there's deep inside them, something that says you need to master the next skill. It's not like a race, but once a skill is good enough, then the child will start working on the next developmental piece because the impulse that tells us we need to be able to get up and move and take care of ourselves is strong. It's strong. It comes from deep, deep from within our uh, evolutionary heritage. So that means we're only going to learn to move just good enough. If we were to spend all of our time on rolling, it would probably not serve us well, right? So we roll and we're like, oh no, I've rolled well enough now. I, I got this mastered. I can roll left, right? I can get up to my, I can get up to my back, to my belly. Hmm. Okay. What can I now start to do on my belly? So there'll be a whole nother range of movements that occur until the child is able to get up and walk. So most of us are using movement patterns that we learned, excuse me, very, very early in the first 
three years of our life. And our general pattern of gait will be pretty much in place within uh, those early, maybe second, third grade here in the United States, um, around seven, eight, nine years old, they'll be in place. What will interrupt some of that is that we'll get an injury or some kind of trauma will happen, or we take up a sport or some kind of hobby, which starts to demand something different from our body, or we sit in a classroom chair, or we learn that some movements are not okay in our culture or and other movements are okay. Or we become very high performing musicians. We have a drive to become a, a musician or, or to learn to really become you know, the next uh, Tiger Woods child prodigy when he was a child prodigy. Um, that stuff doesn't happen by accident. Normally it's a lot, a lot of hours reinforcing particular kinds of movement patterns. So when we only learn to move just good enough, which is gonna be the human condition, and it really is gonna be the human condition to only learn to move just good enough, unless you undertake ways of parsing that apart and learning to move differently, you're gonna have more likelihood of getting wear and tear. This is where we just, you know, it feels fine for the first, 20,000 movements, but then suddenly we start to have some inflammation form and then we get some redness and some heat. And then we might even get some swelling or we get a spasm or we have a knee that won't let us stand on it. This is, this is with the wear and tear that can happen in the system over many years of just moving good enough instead of getting wear and repair. Now we are supposed to have wear just like to build muscle our joints, our uh, bone, everything needs wear, but it needs to be the kind of wear that the body can come back in and repair from, as opposed to wear and tear where it just uh, enters the inflammation cycle over and over again. Same thing is true for the nervous system. These, the early signs of these things were when we overrid something with our breath. So maybe we find, uh, that every time we lift our right arm, we hold our breath a little bit or somebody else could notice it. And it doesn't cause any problem for a long, 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 long time. Or maybe every time we step on our leg, we don't really hold our weight on it very securely. And the nervous system is like, hmm, not very secure there. You don't really have any conscious thought about it, but it starts trying to make adaptations according to what we're experiencing at that nervous system level that will serve us well in the moment, but won't serve us well necessarily over time. It will serve us well in the moment. So the nervous system is only really thinking about this moment and a few seconds out. It's not thinking about 30 and 40 years down the road. So we talked before about what is your kryptonite and you all shared your ideas about what your kryptonite is. But I'm gonna say that the biggest kryptonite issue that most of us have is our lack of awareness and curiosity about our bodies and about our movement. That when we bring these seven keys forward and we become curious and aware of our bodily movements again, that we have the best chance possible of becoming aware of how we move and then learning to move in ways that better serve us. So first we have to become aware of how we move and then we learn ways that better serve us. So one of the big limitations is that we are meant to be habitual creatures. The habit is a super fabulous thing. We need good habits but I said, we only learn to move just good enough. And then we have other things that happen in our lives, injuries, uh, teachings, being told to sit still, things like that. And then we start to wire in habits of this just barely good enough, or sometimes it's a compensatory movement because of the injury that we had. And that compulsive movement and thinking starts to gradually close down our options. We have fewer and fewer options over time. So we really want to harness the power of neuroplasticity, this ability of the brain to keep changing and growing, or for the ability of the brain 
to keep wiring in the same habits deeper and deeper. We want to harness the power of the neuroplasticity and we want to hire, harness the power of bioplasticity. This is the ability of your muscles and bones, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, all of them to be shaped by how we use ourselves. We want to harness that power for good. Now we start, we have started talking about seven keys. I've talked to you about the first one, respecting yourself, right? We got a, I think we got a good uh, head start in respecting yourself. And then we've had a great experience, I hope, for you. I don't know if anybody has put in the comments yet that slowing down and taking time for this lesson didn't feel good for them, but that can happen. But I'm hoping for, I'm hoping for everybody, but I'll take, I'll take the majority that slowing down and taking time is really feels like it yielded something for you. It really opened up something for you. The other keys, which we're not going to go into today, but we will go into it over time uh, in my introductory course with you would be sensing differences for unique but meaningful stimulation by sequencing and timing. Six, identifying unhelpful habits and beliefs. And actually, you all started doing this yourselves when you started talking about your kryptonite. Many of you were talking about something that was unhelpful in terms of beliefs and then creative engagement. So all these keys together really work to give you the most out of the Feldenkrais method. So instead of those limited options, we already know what we want. We wanna move better, feel better, think better, live better. We want that to all lead towards that fulfillment of life that feels like, oh yeah, I got this life. I can do this thing called life. So my program is called Your Learning Body. It's an online Feldenkrais community that's been going for 10 years. I'm pretty sure it's the first membership in the world, but I might be wrong about some countries I know nothing about. So online membership in the world. And it's a, in a fabulous community and I have people that have been in here for 10 years with me and I have people that have just joined last year. And it starts with an introductory course called Discovering Your Learning Body Superpowers, The Seven Keys. And we really take time to take each key and break it down, break it apart, parse it out a little bit more, include it in the lesson. And we're gonna practice, a, uh, we're gonna practice it through Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement lessons. And you can do them live or on replay Classes are going to begin for this group that's joining May 31st, and we offer them twice a week in Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight or Standard Time to make it more likely that more of you can join live. So that's Mondays at 6 p.m. or Fridays at 10 a.m. The theme we're going to explore in this next uh, series, the seven key series in terms of the movement lessons is going to be reclaiming healthy extension. And why would we need to reclaim healthy extension? Well, you'll never see any superhero flying through the air all balled up and scrunched. That's for sure. You're going to need extension to claim that power. And this is something that adults, as adults, we start to lose the ability to have. And I have some really good ideas about how we can make this more possible, regardless of what's been happening with you in your spine and, and uh, health over the years. So there's the seven week course, and you also get the seven keys to your learning body ebook and workbook. We'll have lectures in that course. There will be small and large group discussions, and you'll get access to downloadable audio from that. So what else is inside the your learning body community? What makes it a community? Why would somebody stick around? Well, there are throughout the year, live classes and week long challenges live or on replay. There are full length downloadable awareness through movement lessons on audio, um, over 170 of them. There are not, uh, over 90 short downloadable video lessons for daily easy improvement. And you don't have to download them by the way, you can leave them on the platform, that's up to you. There's a searchable database by length, position, problem area, body area. So you can go in and say, I would like to find lessons for my neck and you'll find lessons for your neck. There's a path to success, which is something you'll never, I don't know if you'll see it anywhere else. 
but I have outlined a path to success of how, how you can use it as a roadmap to getting the most out of your time with uh, me and your learning body and in using the Feldenkrais method as part of it. There's monthly office hours you can tune into and ask questions about where you're at on your journey or something that's happened to you in your movement or you're wondering what you can find to help you. And I can answer those questions. And there's also monthly technical hours with the actual staff so that they can help you for those of you who have trouble with tech related items. There are more live courses coming up over the course of the next year. There'll be a course called um, movement course called healing power of a quiet mind and prayer postures. So these prayer postures, whether you're religious or not, they can illuminate uh, some things for us that we might otherwise skip over flamingo balance. And if you scares you, don't worry, I got you covered. You're not going to be left hanging out in space on one leg unless it's just super easy for you. Uh, rolling for pleasure and vestibular health. And then once a year, I teach a posture power balance course for those with limited mobility. Now, these are not courses that are available. We don't make these available to anyone but the membership. But basically, the membership it gets the majority of my teachings. There's very little that we make available outside the membership. There are also bonuses, which is the sound or sleep session uh, set lessons with Larry Wells. And I believe, yeah, the there's also some other things in there from him related to um, Better Days, Better Nights. It's a really cool series that people have loved. You'll get access to 10, I think it's 10 or more, might be 15, but 10 lessons that I consider essential from the Bones for Life work. This is not a Bones for Life membership. This is a Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement membership, but you will get access to uh, a few Bones for Life processes that I think everyone needs to have. And then also from uh, Larry Wells, you get access to neuro-linguistic program meditations, which are really beautiful. So the program itself, based on what we charge for individual items, not based on some inflated value, is worth over $6,557. And then they have bonuses of $500. So you can start in your learning uh, body for as little as $67 per month. And then if you wanted to go to yearly, you can save the equivalent of two months uh, by going to yearly. Arlene is going to put the link to this in the chat for you right now. So you could open the window to the, the Your Learning Body um, page to learn more about it if you want to. So we have courses inside there already. Like you look at the courses that I've got coming up and you say, well, I don't know if any of those interest me. First of all, I want to say that in the Feldenkrais method, almost everything should interest you because they all turn around and begin to open your, your body, mind, spirit in different ways. And they can surprise you that the things that you didn't think you needed, you really need. But we also have courses on posture in there and uprightness. We have courses on squatting. I, have uh, ones on walking. Don't, I don't have too much on running and jumping, but I have ones on walking, have ones for the shoulder, for the low back. We have ones on meditation sitting, if this is your thing, how to make it easier. We have ones on hamstrings, which are really valuable. Definitely neck, shoulder, the ability to yeah extend and really reach up into the world, the pelvis, the jaw, the face, the mouth, the diaphragm, breathing, uh, feet, pelvic floor health, hips. We have, yeah, we have, we have two courses on hips and one on pelvic floor health um, and, and things that are purely using the imagination, purely using the imagination. And the doors to the membership are open right now. And then they close on Thursday next week, May 16th. This is super important because it's a community. It's not just a, um, oh, you come in and you're on your own. Um, so I want to bring everybody in together. We start to walk through those seven keys. We walk through these lessons together or we roll through these lessons together or we move through these lessons together. So I can bring you along as new people so you can get really acclimated and get the most out of your experience during your time with us.
So I'm hoping you're going to claim your superpower and join me in your learning body. Arlene will put that in the uh, chat for you again. And later today, you'll get the replay for this and you'll also get the link for it. And it's only a few days that you can make that decision to join. So you want to be sure um, that you uh, give it a real consideration that this is what you need. Now, I am going to move to answering questions and you can raise your virtual hand and they can be questions about this program or questions about your own situation. And um, I'm gonna answer some of them in the chat while you're doing that. Virtual, your virtual hand will be at the bottom of your screen under the little smiley face that says reactions if you're on a desktop. And if you're not on a desktop, you're on like a phone, et cetera, um, it'll be on under more, three dots. And you'll have to like click your, put your little finger over the three dots and open that up. Okay, let's see here. I'm gonna back up into some of these questions. Uh, yes, there's gonna be a replay. Uh, Jetta, let's see, okay, let me see, where did I go? Okay, is this helpful for scoliosis? Yes, we have had people who have scoliosis that find it very, very valuable. We also have people with scoliosis that find uh, the Bones for Life program valuable. So that program, I don't think opens until August, um, but both of these programs in different ways, I think can be really, very good for scoliosis, Martha. Uh, Rachel, hi, Rachel. Um, you... We, this particular course is always offered in those times on Mondays and Fridays, and most of them are, but there will be date, there will be weekly challenges that will have different times on it. Um, so they're not all exactly the same. You, so we try to publish them out ahead of time so that you'll know. Uh, and I understand I have to join things live too. It is huge, Sonia. It's very, it's very huge. Um, Jody, is there, if there's visible confirmed joint damage, will Feldenkrais help? Okay, so Feldenkrais is not going to, if you've got degeneration of a, of a significant amount, I mean, everybody has, by a certain age, everybody's got something going on in every joint. So let me just say that first. And you can't judge pain and dysfunction necessarily by what the MRI or x-ray says. That, that's a sticky wicket, to be honest, because many people walk around with similar findings with no pain and no problems. So these are sticky, sticky wickets. But it, if you really are at the place where you need like a total knee or total hip replacement, it's not going to reverse all that for you. There are some things that are not reversible in the human body, at least as far as I know, and everything that I have seen and studied over my years. Um, but you will usually move much better because what happens in this is you've developed a big compensatory problem where you're protecting that hip joint all the time. And if we can get the rest of your body freer, your hip joint moves better too, right? When So things start to freeze up, clamp down. You started to have that problem because you were walking functioning in a certain kind of way in all likelihood. That's not the only reason, but it's a big contributor to it. Um, so you will definitely start to feel and move better. Will it, I mean, I, I feel confident about that, but it probably is not going to save you from having to have a hip or joint replacement if you're at a certain level of decline. Now, however, once you have that joint replacement, so let's say your site, you've already had one, you can, you'll begin to realize, or maybe somebody else says, hey, it turns out you still walk like you walked before. You don't really walk any different than when you had the replacement. And that's because you will remember the compensatory movement patterns that you've developed over the years. They are a habit. And so these classes can really start to help to unravel the habit, the Feldenkrais can really help you to start unraveling the health habits. I don't know what EDU stands for, um, what body of work, but this is not a professional training. So I would guess it does not count for your particular EDU certification requirements. 
Uh, okay, let's go to Lois. And I'm going to ask to unmute you, Lois. We won't see your, we'll see your face as we're talking to you, but it won't be on the recording. Go ahead, Lois. Unmute yourself. There it is. Okay. Uh, so you were talking with during the summit with Delmer, and you mentioned something about pods you have, and I have together, like those of us within the community, if we've signed up. Because I did the I did the course last year and I um, did the membership for the year. Love access to all the amazing things you have. But I was thinking I don't know if there was a pod thing through that of it's, people. It's going to be starting this year. Okay, yeah. right. I'm I'm looking forward to that because I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to put it out in the um, in the items because it really depends on whether people want to do it. And so we can't force something that isn't there. The hunger isn't there, but we are going to uh, arrange for it after the introduction introductory course. We're going to start arranging, helping people arrange for that to meet in their in small peer led groups. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, Luca. Uh, okay. Um Cynthia, thank you very much. I appreciate um, your effort very much um, today. And um, I, maybe I have an awkward question for practitioner. Um, um, I'm, I'm practicing Feldenkrais for, for some years and, and um, I'm a practitioner, but I, you know, I really have this awkward question if doing less is it's putting you in, in this place where you have fewer options. Hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, doing less, it, doing less is more is appropriate within a Feldenkrais lesson. It's not an appropriate way to live life. Of course, but you know, when, when you, <laughs> when, when it's, it feels like nice, I mean, you know, the, the thing is really to calming the nervous system down and 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 do comfortable movements and if if those are very limited and bigger movements are painful mm. take this into your daily life yeah yeah, you? yeah. so you know it's it, it is a, a very important place to start so I'm assuming that everybody here is starting from the beginning and it's a very, very important place to start, but you do eventually want to move towards challenging yourself on your, your ranges, unless you've been told something is harmful for you. So I'm not suggesting people, you know, people who have a specific diagnosis that says never do that movement uh, or you know, you know, you could go things could go really, really bad for you. But that's not the majority of people. The majority of people have got mostly what I would call fairly common musculoskeletal things or injuries or wear and tear. So you do want to start to challenge yourself, Luca. If you're if you feel like you've been told never to challenge yourself in the movements, as you know, some of the Feldenkrais movements are really challenging and can be very, very challenging. And if you stick with only only this really small range, I do think you will limit yourself over time. And I have had many discoveries of where I've challenged myself uh, in that way that I was able to do stuff that I didn't realize I could do. And it opened some doorways for us, but I wasn't trying to cause myself any kind of significant risk. I was still, I built the skill. Hopefully you've built the skill over years where you can go, oh, okay. It did. Yeah. I did hundred times, hundred times and more. So that's, yeah. Yeah. And then otherwise, I'm just going to say that's a kind of a question to be asked uh, in a peer group or in a, by an educational director in you know, that you studied with, because they'll know you better and it's not a beginner kind of question. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take Lance and then, oh, let me get the right button here. I'm going to take Lance and then I'm going to go back over here to the chat as well lance yeah um i'm an absolute beginner i didn't do the conference mm -hmm. 
had the feeling that I wanted to connect with you. I, I don't actually know why, yeah. you know, in a broader way, but my specific um, situation is I'm transgender and I'm looking at top surgery and I'm also 74. So I do things slowly, <laughs> but I would, so I wanted to know how prepping for top surgery and after top surgery would Feldenkrais be, I'm, I'm because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm concerned about right moving slowly through this process and heal, having my nervous right. as calm as possible and healing at, with as much depth as possible. Right. right. I've been yeah. So yeah. So thank you for asking that question, and I think it's a good one. So I'm going to address it from a couple different points of view for any surgery. Um. I think the Feldenkrais method can be very helpful in preparing people for surgery, both in their awareness and um, and also in again making the helping the rest of the body to be available and your mind to be available for the healing. When you start talking about more like what you're talking about, which is basically a kind of reconstructive surgery, it's a form of reconstructive surgery, even though it's going to be taking muscle and tissue from other places and moving it around. Um, you're going to have to have time for healing for that, for sure, that you're going to get guided uh, by the surgeon. Pre, I believe that every skill that you learn about how to listen to yourself, how to be kinder to yourself, how to improve your self image, all these things make a tremendous difference in our outcomes through challenging experiences. And a, a surgery like this is gonna be a challenge, even though it's one that you want, it's still gonna be a challenge. That's, it's, it's a big trauma to the human body. All surgeries are a big trauma to the human body. So having more skills around how to listen to yourself, care for yourself, et cetera, is gonna be very, very valuable. You'll be able to do things in your imagination uh, as you grow in uh, your understanding of how to use the Feldenkrais method and post-surgery. Uh, I think you're going to want quite a bit of that to be able to do quite a bit of that. And that will be very valuable to you. Now, if they've given you or like a range where they say you're not really going to be approved to do much of anything for six months. I don't, I'm not familiar with like what the range is for that surgery in terms of healing, then it might be, I would join monthly. And let's say you don't, you don't have the surgery. You're not having the surgery three months, perhaps I would join monthly and then maybe take a break. And the next time it opens back up, let us know, you know, tell us you want to come back in at that time. Um, I wouldn't join, I might not join yearly if I, if they said, you know, Hey, you're going to have to have healing time where you're not allowed to do a lot. And that is only coming up. And that surgery is coming up in three months. I would probably then only join monthly as opposed to yearly. Normally I will just be honest. I wholeheartedly recommend yearly. It's a commitment to yourself and you will engage more. I've seen it over and over again, that people who who join yearly engage more than the people who join monthly do. So um, I would normally ex ex recommend yearly besides the fact that it saves you money by doing yearly. And uh, Sue asks is, I hope that helps. Hope that helps Lance. Thank you. Yeah. The $67 for joining the community membership is that a monthly fee for the year. It, it will renew at 67 as long as you want to stay a member, including five years down the road. So it anytime, you, as long as you don't let your membership lapse, uh, you'll always get to keep the same rate. And there's people that, you know, joined 10 years ago and have been with me since the beginning, and they're still paying the same rent from 10 years ago, which I think was like, seven or eight dollars <laughs> it's really low <laughs> so what what happens is, is is you get to keep that rate and uh and if you let it lapse then you usually come in at the next level rate when it opens up again uh rheumatoid arthritis osteoarthritis back pain oh gosh we have so much for osteoarthritis back pain uh darlene joined and she's let me say I could use her name and tell everybody this. She joined 
last year, I think it was like November uh, maybe. And she, after 30 days, she wrote in and said, I had such severe back pain that the doctor told me the only thing they could think of next to do was a spinal stimulator. And at 30 days in, she was 95% pain-free. I have to tell you that is a remarkable result, even from my perspective. So I don't know that everybody's going to get that, but uh, I just want to tell that story because it's so uh, inspiring. Rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, but rheumatoid, I want to talk about a little bit different. It's much more inflammatory much more of an autoimmune kind of thing. And yes, I, I've seen people get benefit from it. You know, you're gonna, you have to have a whole plan to deal with rheumatoid arthritis. Movement alone is not gonna be enough, but movement, awareness, movement, simple, easy things that you can do that don't exacerbate the inflammation is going to be huge for you. Huge for you. Hope that helps. Beth, are they all taught by me? Most of them are taught by me, Beth, but I do invite in a couple of guest instructors a year and I'm very careful about who I invite in. And uh, so, but you, the majority of them will be taught by me, but you will get exposure to some other, other facilitators and you will find other facilitators already pre-recorded in the membership too. I hope that helps. Will it uh, help to walk better when using walking sticks? Yes, for, I think this is the same Amber with the RA question, osteoarthritis, almost always in those kinds of situations, uh, walking sticks are a great, great addition. So if you find that, uh, yeah, Paula, there's no, there's no tracking of your attendance or anything related to this, this course. So if it's just like a general, various health practitioner certifications, unless they're extremely lax, I would say the answer is no. Most of them have to require tracking, attendance, uh, completion. This is this is really designed to be, this particular program we have is really designed to be for your own health. Having said that, we do have health practitioners, physical therapists, yoga teachers, Pilates teachers, um, Rachel's a voice teacher. <laughs> she, she's used it. Other teachers that come in and say that they get a lot out of it for making adaptations into their particular field, but it's not oriented in that direction per se. You will see on the on the um, page about signing up. You'll see uh, some lovely testimonials from a couple of physical therapists and a yoga teacher. They're talking mostly about what they have gotten out of it themselves, but they also, uh, in, in those, but they also also have told me how much it's impacted the way they work with their clients and, and students as well. Um, is it helpful for osteoporosis? No. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to the extent that you will start to learn to walk a little more upright and maybe feel better about getting around and doing movement, yes, but I mean, not enough for me to be, be confident at all to say that it helps with osteoporosis. We do have a program called Bones for Life, again, that'll be out later in the year um, that I would, would refer you to for that. Yeah, you can share it. Uh, you'll be able to, the email that comes to you, Beth and um, Jody, the email that comes to you, you can just forward that email to them. It'll have a replay in it. It'll go out later today. Jan, after every lesson, what is the best way to continue to feel that way? Oh, isn't that the truth? I so appreciate that question. So this is somebody who's felt the great benefit after a lesson. And then they also notice when it goes away. So it, it is helpful um, to touch back into pieces of what you can remember from a lesson, excuse me, throughout a week. And one of the reasons I feel so passionate about your learning body is that I want to try to help people to at least build a weekly option but I've tried to make it possible for them to have a daily option with very short videos that they can tune in and do something quick. It makes a difference. It, it just does. You know, when we spend so much of our lives um, acting out in our habitual patterns, 
the majority of the day over and over and over again. Even the way we sleep at night is habitual. The positions, the, what we do with our pillow. I mean, these things are all so deeply embedded in us that um, it is not a one and done kind of thing. The, the, I will say that some people come to this and they get what they want and they leave and that's fine. And I have had conversations with them. Hey, I, I wanted to get my knee in better shape so I could run this, this marathon or whatever. Great. Totally great. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. But a lot of people come to this because they have something pretty significant going on and they've got, they've struggled with it for a long time. And so you, you aren't trapped into staying for sure. You can say, no, this is some for me or whatever. But, um, but in your mind, I would be assuming that you were going to engage with it over time, at least once a week, instead of thinking to yourself, oh, well, I'll go and I'll just do that one series and then I'll be done. And I mean, that's fine. You can do that. If you sign up for monthly, you can come and just do this, you know, just do the series. But I, I think you'll think a year later, I wish I'd have stayed and continued on to do more. So, um, okay, Don, lots of thank you. Thank yous for thanking me. Uh, I was a dancer in my younger life and always moved with a lot of fluidity. Suddenly I'm confronted with a lot of stiffness and pain, likely from perimenopause, estrogen changes. Can this help? Well, I think so. I don't have any direct evidence from the pain and stiffness coming specifically from perimenopause, perimenopausal estrogen changes, but I have an awful lot of women in, in the community that are in that stage or have passed through that stage and has, it's been helpful to them. So I I want, I just want to be, I'm a very honest person about what I think it can help and not help. So I think it'll help you, but I can't promise you that because I have no, nothing based on really clear anecdotal information about that. So Francis, is there anything that can help with herniated discs that are crumbling? Um, well, Here's the thing about that, Francis. So I'm assuming you were diagnosed with degenerative disc disease. So there's definitely things that you can do to help yourself move better and feel better, for sure. This work can be helpful in that. Um, it Will it stop the degeneration? I think that it won't, but I don't know that for sure. But I do think that you can move better anyway. I do think you can move better anyway. This is this is my experience over and over and over and over and over again. So I would encourage you not to get um, too hung up on old herniated discs that are now starting to crumble down. Um, degenerative disc disease and is, as I'm assuming that was your diagnosis. Uh, if it was something different, you can tell me and I might have a different answer to that. Uh, the Monday and Friday classes are the same material. I don't teach it exactly the same way each time because I'm a human being, but, um, but they're the same material so that you don't, you, if you need to mix and match, you can mix and match them, but you'll still get the same lessons. Oh, Kathleen. Well, if Rachel's still here, she'd be happy to comment on this. Can you comment on the value of Feldenkrais for singers with vocal tension issues? Are general lessons available or are there specific ones for the voice preferable? So I've had several people in the membership that were vocal uh, with singers or singers or vocal teachers. And I've also worked with an opera, two opera singers, I've had two opera singers. All of them have said that it's been extremely helpful for them. No, there are not specific ones that I would say are preferable because you're over-focused oftentimes as any kind of high performing person, you're over focused on the thing that you use as your instrument. So you use your voice, somebody else is using their neck and I they got their, their string, you know, here and somebody else is going and then somebody else is, you know, kicking the ball soccer, like a, a mad person. And uh, uh, as those games go wild and free and just get into it and do it right. So you tend to focus on what, 
is your thing to the exclusion of everything else. So you will learn a lot, I believe, about incorporating, uh, bringing more of your body to support your voice and your vocal tension issues. Um, are the weekly classes an hour? In the introductory class, no, they're longer. They're more like an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. Then after that, once we, anytime I'm doing an introductory series for the group, um, those are longer. And then after that, we try to keep everything within the hour. And then there's some things I'm have, I haven't even put it on the calendar yet because I'm still thinking about it. I'm still thinking about it, but I, I, think I've got something that we might do daily that's really short, like half an hour daily together for a week or something like that. So I've got a couple of new ideas I want to play with this time around that I'll change some of that up. After the seven week course, our members on their own to organize a program just and you well yes and no we teach we teach series we don't teach series nonstop Martha we teach a series there's a short break a series short break series short break and the short breaks can be somewhere between usually usually about four or five weeks one of the things that we're going to try this year so I'm going to give you hints and ideas about how I think you can do the best during your break times. So that that's first. I do want you to be able to build a plan on your own and not always have to be in a live class. But the other piece that we're going to start out uh, again with this, retrying this year with everything we know is something called progress pods. And those are peer led groups where you will, uh, people have the option to get together as a small group, like once a week with each other, and they could choose to do a lesson together. They could also just choose to talk about their lives, but we're going to make that easier. We've got a platform that makes it easier to transfer through uh, different time zones, et cetera. And uh, no, we don't have an, uh, well, we don't have an easy way for switching back and forth between monthly and yearly in this grouping, but uh, why don't you write me that question privately to support it future life now and yeah and we'll uh, ask to talk to me and I'll I'll try to understand what's going on for you uh yes Rivka Rivka a member of your learning body for a while and also a Feldenkrais practitioner and an occupational therapist is putting her uh, opinion in here about pain and stiffness definitely affect balance and learning deeper methods of movement absolutely can help you improve balance. Someone asked about balance before. As a long-term occupational therapist, I can say when I was younger, I had no idea how much low levels of pain affect balance. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Did I get everybody? Did I get all the questions? Quite a few of you still left here. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, hanging out with me. So I'm excited. I'm excited that uh, within a fairly short period of time, I will be starting to welcome some people in with a welcome orientation session and then with office hours and then with the actual course. And I hope that you will be there. I hope that you will be there. Yeah, thank you too. Thanks everybody. The replay hopefully will be out uh, and an email will be out within maybe two or three hours. It takes some time to process one that's this long. Okay, good. Bye. I'm glad it was amazing. Glad to hear that.